Hey everyone, welcome back and thank you for joining us again in our next discussion of statistics. Jumping into our objective then, this is kind of a review section for us as we're trying to piece together multiple rules at one time. The diagram we see right now is a huge deal in terms of our thought process. One of the biggest challenges of probability is trying to figure out what the question is actually asking. We have so many different routes we can go, it ends up a bit difficult just how to start the problem. That's where this page comes in handy. This is your thought process. When it comes to exam questions, the first thing we want to ask, are we finding the probability of a single event? Meaning there's not more than one thing happening, we're only asked the probability of one thing, and that leads us to the next question, are these outcomes equally likely? It's a huge deal. As soon as we talk about one single event, the first thing you want to be thinking after that would be, do we have equally likely outcomes? Of course, you see the rest of the diagram, but just to encourage again, this is the thought process we want as we prepare for the exam. Moving to the bottom half of the page now, this is if we have compound events. A compound event means we're asked to find the probability of more than one thing occurring. Like what is the probability that both women survive? As we discussed previously, if we recognize that we've got more than one single event being asked, then the next question like you see is, do the events involve or, and, or at least of course, you see the rest of the diagram as it splits it into those three categories. But just like the question of equally likely outcomes, after recognizing more than one single event and a probability question, we want immediately, like second nature, to be asking ourselves, okay, is this an or situation, an and situation, or an at least situation? So let's go ahead and jump into our example. We're discussing the old game show, Deal or No Deal, since it involved probabilities. In the game, a contestant is presented with 26 suitcases that contain amounts ranging from one cent up to a million bucks. The contestant must pick an initial case that is set aside as the game progresses. So you first pick one case and you hold on to that case. The amounts are randomly distributed among the suitcases prior to the game. The question is, what are the chances the contestant selects a suitcase worth at least 100 grand? Referring back to the previous page, our first question will be, this is a probability question. Are we asked the probability of a single event or a compound event? The question is, what are the chances the contestant selects a suitcase worth at least 100 grand? Which means that this is a compound event, and of course we're discussing an at least situation. Into our analysis, each prize amount is randomly assigned to one of the 26 suitcases, so the outcomes are equally likely. That is, just to repeat, we've got 26 suitcases to choose from, but since they're randomly assigned values, there's only one of each value. Therefore, each suitcase has an equally likely chance of having any specific value. Thus, we can use the classical method since we have an equally likely situation. Now that we've recognized that we can use the classical method, we're going to say let event E be that the kept suitcase is worth at least $100,000. And we're going to calculate the probability. Remember with the classical method, we have the probability of event E is equal to the number of ways that E can occur over the number of outcomes in the sample space. Looking at the provided table, we see that there are seven suitcases that fall in the category that we're looking for, since we're looking for the suitcases worth at least $100,000. Seven suitcases are worth from $100,000 up to the one million, therefore the number of ways that E can occur is seven, and the number of outcomes in the sample space is of course 26, since we have 26 total suitcases. Suitcases. So the probability that we select a suitcase worth at least $100,000 is 7 over 26. Drawing our conclusion from our math then, the probability that the contestant selects a suitcase worth at least $100,000 is about 26.9%. That is, in 100 different games, we would expect about 27 games to result in a contest choosing a suitcase worth at least $100,000. Jumping into our next example then, we're told according to a Harris poll in January of 2008, 14% of adult Americans have one or more tattoos, 50% have pierced ears, and 65% of those with one or more tattoos also have pierced ears. We're asked what is the probability that a randomly selected adult American has one or more tattoos and pierced ears? Well, the first part of our analysis would be to ask, is this an event involving and or or? Meaning we're discussing compound events again since we're discussing one or more tattoos and pierced ears in our probability question. 
And we know we've got an and situation because they say one or more tattoos and pierce ears. Now that we recognize we're dealing with an and situation, this is where the problem gets a bit trickier because we need to figure out what we want to call event E and what we want to call event F. Now remember, they're just variables, so it doesn't specifically matter which one we call E and F. We're just trying to stay consistent with what we've been doing with our language in order to keep everything organized. Going back to our information then, 14% of adult Americans have one or more tattoos. We can call this event E or F, again it doesn't matter, but right now it's just one piece of information. It hasn't given us a whole lot. Same with the 50% who have pierced ears, still just one piece of information. Could be E, could be F. The crucial sentence then would be the 65% of those with one or more tattoos also have pierced ears. Making sure we're careful when we read this, 65% of those with one or more tattoos, and I'm gonna stop there. With one or more tattoos means that we're not looking out of everyone. Instead, now we're only looking at those with one or more tattoos. That means one or more tattoos from this sentence we're going to call the given information. Because in this sentence, the 65% only applies to those who have tattoos. So given that people have tattoos, 65% of them also have pierced ears. Since the one or more tattoos is what we are calling the given now, we're going to call that event E. That means the 14% represents the probability of just event E, and the 50% that have pierced ears represents the probability of event F. Now just in case that's still a bit confusing, let's elaborate a little bit visually. If the rectangle represents our sample space, then event E we have called those with one or more tattoos, and event F would be those with pierced ears. Now remember, the big idea of conditional probability is that it changes the sample space. So right now, the rectangle represents our sample space. But in the statement we're given that 65% of those with one or more tattoos also have pierced ears, it means that we're only looking at those who have tattoos. Therefore, the rectangle is no longer our sample space. Instead, the sample space is only that circle that we have for E, representing those with tattoos. And within E, they are telling us that 65% of those have also pierced ears. So let's continue with our analysis then. Since we have an and situation, are the two events independent? Now this brings up a statement that was a bit confusing the first time it was introduced. A test for independence would be that if the probability of F is not equal to the probability of F given that E has occurred, then that means we've got two events that are not independent. Again, the logic was that if E occurs and affects the probability of F, then the probability of F given that E has occurred would not be equal to the probability of F showing that they are not independent. Now applying this to our problem, we've got 50% of people have pierced ears as our probability of event F. Meanwhile, 65% of those with one or more tattoos also have pierced ears, and we've called having pierced ears our event F. Therefore, the 65% of those with one or more tattoos who also have pierced ears represents the probability of F given that E has occurred. And since the probability of F is not equal to the probability of F given E, we've got two events that are, in fact, not independent. And now that we've recognized that we have two events that are not independent, we know that we need to use the general multiplication rule, which is the probability that events E and F occur is equal to the probability that event E occurs multiplied by the probability that event F occurs given that E has occurred. From the problem, we know the probability of event E would be 14%. The probability of F given E was 65%. Multiplying those, we get a 0.091. So the chance of selecting an adult American at random that has one or more tattoos and pierced ears is 9.1%. That takes us to our next objective, which would be to determine the appropriate counting technique to use. Now, keep in mind, we're changing gears here. The question is no longer going to ask us what is the probability of yada yada. Instead, the question will be something along the lines of in how many ways can this or that happen, etc., like we did previously. You see the chart in front of you, of course. The first question we want to ask would be are you making a sequence of choices? Huge deal there. If we're making a sequence of choices, that sends us down one major path. If we are not, it sends us down another major path. Of course, from there, you see the different questions to ask. Let's go ahead and jump into our example. We are told there are 43 drivers in the Daytona 500, and how many different ways could the drivers finish first, second, third, and fourth? Now this is where we have more than one option to approach this. We can think of it in terms of permutations and combinations, or we can think of it in terms of a sequence of choices or results to apply it more specifically. If we're thinking in terms of permutations or combinations, the first question we know would be to ask, does order matter? And since we're talking about drivers finishing a race, of course order matters first, second, third, and fourth place. 
Now if we decide to go the route of permutations, then that means we're in an NPR situation where we've got 43 drivers. We need to pick four of them since we're talking about first, second, or third. Applying the formula, of course, we end up with 43 factorial over 43 minus 4 factorial. Simplifying this, we get 43 factorial over 39 factorial. Like we did previously, if we're asked to do this by hand, we can expand the 43 factorial to be our 43 times 42, 41, 40, down to 39. Remember, we can stop at 39 factorial because the 39 factorial will cancel out with our denominator that is 39 factorial. Thus, we're left with 43 times 42 times 41 times 40 to get our result. Before we find that result, let's jump over to the sequence idea then. If our thought process jumped to a sequence of finishers, we can think to ourselves, well, we've got first place and second place and third place and fourth place. So the question is, how many of these drivers can win the race? Well, 43 of them can win the race, but once that driver wins the race, there are only 42 drivers left to finish second. Therefore, 42 drivers can finish second, 41 can finish third, and of course, 40 can finish fourth if we follow that logic. We end up with the same result then where we have 43 times 42 times 41 times 40 like we did from the NPR approach and that gives us a result of 2,961,840 different ways drivers can finish first, second, third, and fourth. On to our next example then. We're told the Hazelwood City Council consists of five men and three women. How many different subcommittees can be formed that consist of three men and two women? Again, we have to be careful to recognize this is not asking us probability. Instead, they're asking us how many different subcommittees can be formed that consist of three men and two women. So let's move into our analysis. First, we need to ask ourselves, can a man or a woman be chosen twice? The answer to that is no, so that means we have no replacement to worry about. Next, we need to ask ourselves, does order matter when we choose? And the answer to that is no, because again, they just said subcommittees. They didn't say anything along the lines of rank or anything like that. And lastly, do the men who are chosen have any effect on the women who are chosen? And the answer to that is also no, meaning whatever men are chosen, it doesn't make any difference to the women that are chosen. Therefore, we've got a sequence of choices here. We can either choose the men first or we can choose the women first. It won't make a difference to our result in how many different subcommittees can be formed. This means we can use the multiplication rule of counting to find the result since we're talking about a sequence of choices. Now to add an extra layer of sophistication though, within those sequence of choices, we have either a permutation or a combination. That is, our final result will come from the multiplication rule of counting where we're gonna multiply the number of ways that men can be chosen by the number of ways that the women can be chosen. Now the number of ways that we can choose the three men would be a five choose three since we have five men and we need three of them in this subcommittee, which of course would lead us to a five factorial over a three factorial multiplied by the quantity that is five minus three factorial, leaving us with five factorial over three factorial times two factorial, which if we were asked to do this by hand, we could break down further, but a result ends up being 10. And the number of ways that we can choose two women would be a three choose two, since we have three women and we need two of them, which of course leads us to three factorial over two factorial, multiplied by the quantity three minus two factorial, which we could break this down further, of course, if we need to do by hand, but that will lead us to a result of three. Now we need to take these two separate results and apply them to our multiplication of counting. That is, we had 10 different ways that the men could be chosen, and we had three different ways that the women could be chosen. Therefore, the total number of different subcommittees that can be formed would be 30. And we're all set. And thank you again for joining us.